well, that would be a challenge because I always have a lot to say. Um, so, you know, so I was debating between the two possible directions I could go, and then I, uh, you know, since uh, somehow the night was uh, very challenging yesterday uh, at Anton's place, I decided to go for the easier option, which is to talk about something that it's actually already been written and where all, where all of the details are worked out. Uh, so, so what I want to tell you is the, uh, is the situation with how conformal invariance of the underlying Gaussian free field, of the continuum Gaussian free field, somehow manifests this itself at the level of the extreme process. Okay? And so what I will do is that I'll do this by giving you a list of theorems and, you know, with some indication how some of these things are proved. And, of course, the details are, I think, it's a 48-page paper uh, that you can download on the archive, uh, which is the second in the series of my papers with Oren on this. Uh, second and last so far. <laughs> um, okay. So in order to discuss uh, conformal invariance, so what is conformal invariance? Uh, you say that a model is conformally invariant if its particular quantity uh, is preserved under uh, conformal transformations of an underlying domain. So the model has to be defined over a complex plane indexed by domains, and uh, it behaves in some natural way under the conformal maps. Okay? Now, <coughs> so what, what, we will, what I will do is that I'll actually, the property will be the law of an, uh, an underlying random uh, measure. Okay? So what I will start is that I'll, you know, start with uh, giving you some information about the collection of domains over which I would just consider. So D will be a collection of sets in the complex plane which are open, which are bounded, open, and which have the following property for the boundary. If you look at the boundary, uh, the boundary is by, uh, is, you know, it need not be connected, but it can be decomposed into connected components. And what I will require is that the boundary has a finite number of connected components, and each component has a finite diameter, okay? <laughs> now, this will actually, the details for this will not really surface inside the talk, but the reason for uh, doing it this way is because I need some information about how the harmonic measure, which is the hitting probability of the random walk, on the discretized version of the domain converges to the corresponding harmonic measure for the continuum problem. And those are the domains for which this translation can be done. Okay, so the boundary uh, 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 finite, finite uh, number of components, uh, all positive diameter. Okay, so, so an example of a domain would be something which may look like this. You know, you can have, uh, okay, so this is, this is your set D. What I'm drawing you the boundary, the set need not be uh, simply connected, but you know I, I cannot just uh, take a whole you know take a point out that would not uh, qualify as a positive diameter component of the boundary. Okay. Now actually isolated singularities could be handled as well, but we just don't. Okay. <coughs> All right. So that's one thing, and then now I have to also tell you how I discretize this, and uh, the discretization will be such that so so we in fact allow for a variation in the discretization. You can sort of, you know, there are some uh, conditions on the discretizations, but let me just uh, choose a particular one. So I'll take a set of all points in Z2, such that, uh, such that the distance of x over n to the complement of D is larger than 1 over n. Okay? So this is the uh, statement. So 1 over n will be a lattice spacing of the lattice that I put on this. So just think of this, you know, putting this at, uh, you know, 1 over n. And then I just take, you know, so the way you want to think about this is that around each point you take, take a unit square. And if that square lies entirely in D, then you take that point. Otherwise, you don't. Okay? And that has the advantage that your discretized domain will know of all of these funny, uh, you know, very thin parts of the boundary that you take out. Your, discret your discretized domain will, you know, will kind of, you know, go around this as well. No, no, no. The, the dn will be a subset of z2, 
And, and when I scale the set dn by n, I want this to be close to the set d, but I only take the points which are inside whichever, whichever distance larger than 1 over n. Yes. Yeah, 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 because that's right. So dn, dn will be an ordinary sequence of sets, but you know, I will scale whenever I formulate things, I'll scale the distances by n, as I've done before. Okay. All right, and then, uh, and then, you know, I will use various notations, but, you know, I wrote H uh, of dn, uh, which is the discrete Gaussian free field uh, in uh, dn uh, zero boundary condition. Okay. So that's, uh, you know, so that's sort of the setting. Okay. And then, uh, so, uh, so, so, you it was yesterday, I, I showed you, I mean, I gave you sort of a sketch of the argument, which shows that for D being a unit square, if I look at the empirical measure, uh, a point process, which is associated with the local maxima of the field, which are, you know, commensurate with the size of the actual global maximum, then uh, this process converges to a Poisson point process with, uh, with uh, a random intensity measure. And so, you know, so I will start by giving you that statement again, but now for this particular domain, okay? So I will define n, a dot d, n, r to be the set of all points in d n, the sum over all points, with the restriction that h x actually dominates the values of the field uh, in the neighborhood of x, in an r neighborhood of x, so the r is here. And then I take just the uh, product of the point measure at x over n and a point measure at uh, h x minus an n, okay? And this field really should be the one in dn, so I should write all of here, I should write the dn's. Okay, so with each sample of the field, I, I associated such a point measure. So this is a point measure Uh, which will be com which will live on d cross r because d n over n is the scaling version is contained in d. Okay, and now the theorem is uh, that there exists a random measure uh, indexed by d uh, on uh, you know on d bar such that. Uh, for every Rn going to infinity, with the restriction that it doesn't do it uh, faster than linear, I mean, it doesn't do that linearly, uh, eta uh, Rn in D converges to a Poisson point process with the intensity measure dx. Uh, and then I get E to the uh, alpha H h uh, with a minus sign. I'm fond of my minus sign with this card game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because, right, right, so where alpha is 2 over root g, okay? And the measure has the following properties. So let me, uh, let me list a few of those. So I, I said yesterday that the measure, so first thing is the measure a priori lives actually on the closure of the set, okay, but it assigns zero mass to the boundary, okay, uh, almost surely. Uh, it in fact assigns zero mass to any fixed uh, set of uh, zero Lebesgue, zero Lebesgue measure, okay, so. I'm sorry? It's random. It's a random measure. That's all I, I can tell you right now. The statement of this theorem is that there exists a random measure. So or actually you're thinking about what that means? Yeah, so, so, you know, so the space of measures, Borel measures, can be endowed with Polish topology, okay? So you have Borel sigma algebras on that space, and so you can consider measures on the space of measures, as we just saw in Europe. And, uh, and, and uh, th these are in your stock, those were probability measures, and these are just, you know, um, these are just regular ordinary positive measures, okay? <coughs> so, um, 
right? So, so the statement, you know, and then z of a equals zero almost surely uh, if uh, the Lebesgue measure, I'm going to write LEB for the Lebesgue measure. So that, uh, it is important, yeah. Because if it were not random, this would be just an ordinary Poisson coin process, you know, with some underlying spatial distribution. Uh, what, and the statement will be false, yeah. <laughs> I mean, the measure, you know, I discussed, I discussed this yesterday, is the measure basically encodes all of the residual correlations that, that, that the Gaussian, discrete Gaussian free field in two dimension has. Yeah, a similar theorem, we, I haven't quite checked that, but, you know, should be true also for the three dimensional discrete Gaussian free field. However, in that case, this would actually be an ordinary Lebag measure. Okay, so that's, that's, that's in fact the most interesting feature of the two dimensional model that this measure remains random in the limit. Okay, so let me uh, give, uh, continue with these properties. Uh, the measure of the whole set is finite, almost surely. Okay, and it has the property that for every A uh, open, uh, Z of uh, A is uh, positive, almost surely. Okay, so every set gets, uh, so every open set with positive quality gets that. This almost surely can be, in fact, done over, your, over open sets because I can just cover the space by countably many um, using the, the, second, the first property. Uh, what else? Z, ZD is non-atomic. Okay. Let me see if, if there's anything more I wanted to say. Yeah. Uh, Okay, this is fine. And and if D is in fact a union, a disjoint union of, you know, because I'm not assuming that my D is in fact uh, connected, so it can be a union of, of a bunch of open sets with uh, D I disjoint, uh, then the measure in D is in fact the sum of the measures uh, on the components. Uh, with the uh, ZDI uh, independent. Okay, so this is an equality in law. So, you know, I take a measure which lives, you know, when I say it's a measure on D, what I mean is concentrated on D, but I can always think of it as a measure on the whole complex plane. And in this sense, you can write this measure and a sum of these measures where each of them puts its all of its mass on the corresponding subplane. Okay. So this is sort of the full basic information that comes from the, uh, the theorem that I gave you sort of some ideas of the proof yesterday. Okay. So, so, you know, I would like to go back to this question. So, you know, so the, the, the most, interesting, most interesting feature of this statement is this random measure. And this random measure needs to be studied and somehow independently characterized. That's, that's really the, 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 the goal, okay, or should be. So let me start by giving you some properties of this random measure, which uh, uh, which you can uh, which you can think of. So I have basically have a family of these measures that is of their probability laws indexed by sets in this uh, in this D. They don't exist on the same probability space because you know I just construct their distribution. Okay, but I can make a lot of distributional identification. So one is that the measure. Has uh, behaves very nicely under shifts and dilations. Okay, so if I if I take a set D, you know, from the class of allowed domains, and if I take A in the complex plane, and I take lambda positive, then I claim that if I take this set, shifted, scale it by lambda and shifted by A, and 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 I compose this with the uh, with the map at the level of the uh, coordinates, so a plus uh, lambda dx, that in law gives me the same thing as uh, z of d dx multiplied, let me just do the multiplication first. Okay, so the fact that the law is shift invariant is not a big surprise because the Gaussian free field had a shift invariant law, so if I shift, you know, my domains by 
you know, some number of units at the macroscopic level, everything shifts, but the extreme distribution, I mean, uh, the only thing, thing that shifts is the argument of the measure, right? The measure puts its mass uh, onto the corresponding shifted domain. So the issue is that, you know, why is this true with the, why does the scaling behave in this particular way? And that's, this is a prime consequence of the existence of the limit. And what I would like to explain to you is this four, because that's, uh, you know, that's kind of a universal number. It cannot get more explicit than that. <laughs> okay, so let me give you uh, the proof of the. Uh, it's hard to say. This is really tight. Yeah, this is really tight. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, no, it's it's two plus something. Okay, so for the Lebesgue measure, so for the Lebesgue measure, uh, you get. Uh, it sh I think it should be L to d plus something, right? Uh, d plus something in here, but I forgot what I said exactly. But uh, but uh, you know this four. If this you know if you take the Lebesgue measure, the Lebesgue measure scales by a factor lambda squared. Okay. So this measure somehow seems to scale much faster than the Lebesgue measure, okay? And, but this is only an information in law. So you cannot think of this as sort of, you know, taking the measure and kind of, you know, boosting it up and all of a sudden, you know, so much mass springs up, okay? So this is the distributional information. So that, you know, this is already, this already somehow tells you that the measure has to be supported on a very, very singular set, okay? Yes. I was, I'm just going to do the argument, yeah. So, so, you know, I will show you that this has to be such a factor, and what's more in most interesting is why the four appears, okay? So, so here, is the, here is the argument, so I'm just going to do it for, you know, I don't have to deal with the shifts, okay? So I'm going to uh, set the a to zero, and I look at two domains. I look at the domain d, and I look at the d domain lambda d, which is also of, of the allowed form, okay? Now, the... You know, so my argument will in fact require that lambda is rational. So I will assume that lambda is rational. Okay, because I want to be able to uh, use the limits. I mean, you can you can easily fix the the rest. Okay, so let's look at the. So let me look at first the probability of the maximum in lambda d to be of a certain form. So I'm I'm gonna do it only for the total mass. So maximum of h uh, in domain lambda d is less than m n plus t, right? So we know by the theorem this should converge to the expectation of e to the minus 1 over alpha e to the minus alpha t. See, now I'm getting the minuses right. Uh, z d of uh, uh, z lambda d of lambda d. Okay, so this is true. This is just a rewrite of that statement for the total maximum for this measure, because that, that information is contained in the, uh, in the extreme path, okay? <coughs> Good, so, but now I can, you know, but what is H of lambda D? So this is actually lambda D N. So, uh, you know, lambda D N is really, uh, lambda is really D of lambda N, okay, by the properties. So I can now take this and I can bury the, uh, the, the dependence into the n dependence. So, the, so this is also equal to the probability that the maximum of h in d uh, uh, lambda n is less than mn plus t. But you know, but what I would like to do, I'd like to write the lambda n in here. So I'll write lambda n in here plus t plus m n minus m lambda n, okay? Now let me remind you that m n, you know, had a, had a logarithmic term and a log log term, and the log log term, the difference of the log log terms will disappear on this, and the difference of the log terms gives me exactly log lambda times whatever the factor was, and so this by uh, is two root g log lambda with a minus sign plus uh, vanishing quantities, okay? And so by the, by the statement of the theorem now for the domain lambda n, d lambda n, I get for the sequence of lambda n's, I get this is e to the minus one over alpha, e to the minus alpha, and now I have to write t 
minus uh, 2 root g uh, log of lambda uh, of z uh, d of g. Because instead of a domain d, instead of domain lambda d, I'm now scaling the domain d, but not by n, but by lambda n. Okay, so that's, that's the trick. And so you see that, that this, so, you know, so when I look at this term in here, that because the alpha can be chosen arbitrary in this game, I'm, I'm allowed to generate all positive numbers in here. And so I know, again, by the, you know, what I told you, I therefore know the Laplace transform of this total mass measure, okay? This is a random variable, it's the total mass of that measure, and this, you know, gives me access to the Laplace transform. And this gives me also access to all of Laplace transform, and so, so equality of Laplace transforms gives you equality in distribution, okay? So what do I get? So I get that z lambda d of lambda d has to be equal in law to whatever multiplies 1 over alpha e to the minus alpha t. But that's exactly the term e to the uh, minus minus gives me plus. Uh, I get a 2 root g log lambda uh, z d d. Okay? Now you look at this factor, so this is lambda to uh, uh, alpha two root g, and because alpha was uh, two over root g, this is two times two, this is four. Let's take this lambda too. Okay, I'll let you ponder about that. I haven't thought about this question. Okay, the fact that there is a two, the fact that there is a two is, this, this two is a dimension, yeah. I think it's actually, I think it's actually a 2D, but you know, let's not worry about that. <laughs> okay, I don't want to get into this discussion. My D is equal to 2 and the argument works for that, okay? Let's discuss this afterwards, okay? Because we can, you know, we can go at length and I would have to do the calculation to, to be convinced. Yeah, yeah, so you, so you agree, it's 2D, yeah, 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 I think it's 2D, yeah, okay, so this, you know, so this explains this uh, lambda to the 4 factor, okay, so this, you know, and, uh, all right, so, you know, so we know that, you know, the measure is invariant distribution on the shifts, on the scaling, so it has this property, so if you look at the, if you look at the, uh, uh, the Lebesgue measure and you say, you know, how does Lebesgue measure transport under conformal maps, okay? So the Lebesgue measure is actually not preserved by conformal maps. I, you need to scale the Lebesgue measure by the, s by the square of the derivative of the conformal map in order to get a measure which is, which is conformal invariant that gives you naturally the hyperbolic uh, metric or hyperbolic measure, okay? So, so we will, I will now make a statement which the similar kind of ideology gives you a, a, a transformation rule for the ZD on the conformal maps. Now I need to erase stuff. Well, you know, there, 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 there's a lot of dependence which yeah. is built, and 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 that dependence can be resolved into some independence and some correlations, which I'll show you. That's the Gibbs Markov property, and somehow it's the scaling of the dependent part which uh, is responsible for this. Okay, let me. Uh, I mean, okay. So so here's a theorem. Okay, so. So let uh, D be a set in the, uh, you know, in, in the class of the allowed uh, domains. And assume, assume uh, F is a conformal map, so it's a univalent, it's a bijective analytic bijection. It's an analytic, uh, so on some D prime, which is the uh, F of D, uh, is an analytic bijection.
So it's a univalent map, which is analytic. <coughs> then I can look at the law of the measure in FB, uh, evaluating this uh, under the under the push forwards of, uh, of of sets by F. So let me write it like this. You know, so this is the best way to sort of encode the change of coordinates like this. So what that means is that if you give me a set, I first push it by F into a set in this uh, in this domain, and then I evaluate the measure on this. And then the statement in law is that this, in fact, has the property that you get the fourth power of the epsilon. Okay. So now we can try to do, so if I take the, a domain to be simply connected, I can try to uh, do the same trick that allows you to define the hyperbolic uh, measure, which is invariant on the conformal maps. And so this, you know, so there is an in particular. Uh, if D is simply connected, uh, the measure when you take you take the conformal radius. If you don't know what this is, I'll define this. Just want to make sure that my powers are right. Uh, yes, minus four. So minus four uh, Z D D X. Okay, so, so I take my random measure, but I modulate it by this red indicative term. So this is a, a, po a positive term that I'll explain what it is. So I claim that if you do this for simply, for conformally, for simply connected domain, then this measure now transforms conformally. Okay, uh, the law of, let me write this slide down. The law of this measure uh, is conformally invariant. So it's a so of course the measure itself will not be conformally invariant, not in the realization sense. But if you if you evaluate it on 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 a set, and now you use conformal map to push this into another domain, so you push both the set you evaluate this on and the measure. I mean this this whole thing. Then uh, then you get the measure in the new domain evaluated on the on the pushed uh, on the pushed set. Okay. So right right. So I'll uh, I'll I'll do this. So. So what is conformal radius? It's, it's the way to define a distance from a point to the boundary of a set in a way that that's preserved under conformal maps. Okay? So, so here's, the, uh, here's the statement. So if I, have a, if I have a domain D and I have a point X, I can always find a map G onto the unit disk such that the point, uh, so this is the unit disk, so this is a sort of all these which, uh, which are in the complex plane, which is uh, radius less than one, okay? And what I want is that g of x is equal to zero, so the point gets mapped to the origin, and then, you know, then there is still a one parameter family of these maps, and so what I can do, I can arrange so that the derivative at zero is in fact a, a real and non-negative number. Okay, and this fixes the conformal map, uni the, the map uniquely by the Riemann mapping theorem. Okay, and then the definition for this map, the conformal radius of x, is one over the, is the reciprocal value of the derivative of the modulus of the derivative at that point. Okay, so the con so what this says is that you know how how much I do I need to distort the neighborhood of a point in order to squeeze the set into uh, into uh, a unit disk by conformal maps. Now there is, there are, you know, there's uh, by Kerber. We actually know that the radius uh, is uh, is less than. So one is by. Okay, let me just do the safe, uh, the, the safe part. So it's less than four times the distance from x to the boundary of D, and uh, it's larger than a quarter times the distance of x to the boundary. Okay, so the conformal radius, this is a, a fact about conformal maps, is that the distortion is uniformly bounded. Uh, the, Euclidean, the Euclidean distance is not conformally invariant, but the conformal radius is, is within only constants from it. Okay? So it's essentially the distance to the boundary, if you want. Okay? And so that's the, that's the, that's the factor that, that comes in here. Yeah. 
Right, so if you want to know, you know, how does this rather Nicodemus term change as you uh, go to the boundary, it goes really like the distance uh, to power minus 4. Okay. So notice that, you know, you need to scale this measure up close to the boundary to get something called full invariance. The reason for that is that, you know, there is always, a, even if you take, you know, a very tiny a, a disk which is stuck very close to the boundary, there is a conformal map which brings it right in the middle of your set, okay? So even if that, that disk has a very small Euclidean diameter, you can bring it into the middle where it would receive a significant mass. So the only way you have to, s that's the reason why you have to scale up the total mass of the boundary to get, to, to make, to keep this conformal invariant, okay? In other words, well, okay. Let me, uh, let's see. Uh, let me actually, uh, okay. And let me at least explain, I won't uh, explain much about the proof of this theorem, but uh, I will let me convince you that the conformal, you know, using the conformal radius in here is the right thing. It's because the consequence of the, if I, if I now take a domain D and I map it conformally to some FD, and then I consider the, the, the uniformizing map from that, and I can compose the two maps and I get the uniformizing map from, from F. Okay, so what I can do is I can take a domain D, I can map it using F on FD, and then I take a uniformizing map uh, onto the unit disk. Then, uh, then X gets mapped into FX, and uh, that gets mapped uh, to zero, okay? That's, that's where I want things to go. Then, of course, the composition of these two maps provides the uniformizing map from here to there. That's a fact about, you know, the uniqueness of this map. And so if I want to calculate the, 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 the derivative over here, then, you know, so then one over, so let me, let me kind of do it. I used up too much space. Let me Okay, so I claim that as a consequence, so maybe let me just write a consequence in there and then we will convince ourselves that this is true. Again, I'll, I'll be careful not to do it wrong. So as a consequence of that, the conformal radius in the domain FD for a point FX is actually the derivative of F times the conformal radius at DX. Okay, so that's the consequence of the, of the, uh, you know, of this composition. And uh, so that tells you that if you want to somehow steal those four factors of the derivative, you need to divide by the fourth power of the conformal radius because then that term will uh, easily reproduce itself in the, in the conformal, on the conformal transformation. Okay, so that's, uh, that sort of essentially justifies the second part based on the first one. Now the first one is, okay, so, um, what does go into that proof? So, so certainly this is a special case of that statement, okay? Because if I take a map which simply blows everything by a factor of lambda, then the derivative of that is lambda, so I get lambda to the fourth, okay? Now, if I could somehow localize this effect, if I look at a conformal map, locally the conformal map is a composition of a shift, dilation, and rotation, okay? And so if I could somehow localize the effect of the conformal map on the measure Z, then, you know, locally I would see exactly the dilation by factor uh, F prime of X. However, there's also the rotation. So if I, take, uh, if I take a domain, right, and I map it conformally onto some other domain, then even if I started with a nice grid in here, this grid will become, you know, somehow perturbed and, uh, and rotated grid, okay? And so, in order to even justify this, yeah, I, you know, the main, the main issue is to prove that the measure is also rotationally invariant, okay? And that cannot be done uh, in a simple way, at least that's what we concluded with Oren, and essentially, you know, most of the paper is, is the proof of the rotation invariant, because alongside that, uh, you will get uh, you can do. Yeah, yeah, because, because, you know, the lattice stays where it is, right? So, so if, if, if I give you this box and my lattice is like this, right, then, 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 uh, then, then, the, then I, there is no transformation that can take this into the... 
Exactly. So it's a, you know, it's the, these, these, these things, and this is exactly the correct point, these are in fact statements of some universality. Okay, that it should sort of not matter. So if I, instead of, you know, taking the lattice the way I do it, and I rotate it by 45 degrees, it would give me the same distribution in the end. Okay? And of course, the universality would be stronger, even if you start with different lattices. But that, you know, but that's, that's sort of a, that's the next level of uh, how we can say that. Okay. So let me... Uh, See how I'm doing on time. Okay. Right. So, so you know, so basically there are two issues. I, you know, first thing I said, if I could somehow localize the effect of the conformal map, uh, I would be in, in in business to use the scaling, the dilation property to to kind of you know get the uh, the, the power of the uh, modulus of the derivative, and and so I first have to address that question. Okay. And this is, uh, this is the statement of the Gibbs-Markov property. So this is something I talked about, I think, on Tuesday, is where I showed you that if I take, uh, if I take a Gaussian field, okay, so I, again, my entry is my domain, and I, can, and I condition on part of the, and I condition on part of the values, then I can write this conditional field. Uh, this conditional field will be harmonic on the on harmonic discrete harmonic function on the complement, and the difference of the original field and that will have the law of the discrete Gaussian free field in a smaller domain. Okay, so the statement is such that, that if you have d tilde as a subset of d, then the Gaussian free field in d n can be written as a uh, sum of a Gaussian free field and d tilde n, plus some uh, binding field, as we call it, okay, which is indexed by the two domains. And these are independent. And the, uh, the, the, the paths of this field are discrete harmonic functions. So in fact, you know, there's more, you know, there are discrete harmonic on dn tilde, and on dn, on the difference of the two sets, they in fact are equal uh, in distribution to the corresponding restriction of these values. So the way you can generate this field is that you take a sample of this field that gives you the values on the difference of the set, and then there's a unique discrete harmonic extension of this into the, into the rest, okay, just by the, uh, just by the solution of the Dirichlet problem. So this is how you characterize this. Now, now the point is that uh, you know there is no limit of this object as n tends to infinity because it sort of formally converges to the, to the continuum Gaussian free field, which is not a function, and neither is of that object. <laughs> However, this object admits a uh, continuum limit, and that's sort of the driving force of the whole uh, of the whole game. Okay, so here's the statement for this. <coughs> Okay, so I have to, I have to, you know, give you some definition. So let me give you a definition. <coughs> so let, so given, you know, given a set of d in my class, let pi d x uh, a be defined as the probability that uh, uh, for the Brownian motion started at x, the value at the exit point from the boundary. So let me uh, look at when it uh, when it hits the complement. So by continuity, it hits the complement on the boundary. Uh, this lies in A. Okay. So this is a this is now a measure. This is the exit distribution of the Brownian path from D. Okay. I've uh, started at X. Now this is a measure which is concentrated on on the boundary of the set. It's called the harmonic measure, indexed by you know harmonic measure from X. Uh, it's a probability measure because I, I wrote it as probability. Okay. And now you can define, using this probability measure, I can define the following kernel. I take the integral of pi d x dz log of uh, y minus z uh, minus g times the integral 
pi d tilde uh, of x d z uh, log of uh, y minus z. Uh, and this is over the boundary of the tilde domain, and this is of the boundary of the d domain. Okay, so, so what is this? So, so the feature of this measure is that if you give me a nice function, or let's say a continuous function on the boundary, then if I integrate the function against this measure, I get a harmonic function because this measure is, ha is harmonic in x, and the measure extends continuously the boundary values for sufficiently nice domains. That's sort of the key to the Dirichlet problem in, in the plane space. Okay, so 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 these are both. So I, so what do I do here? I take a function which is a log of y minus z. So if y is not on the boundary, then this will always be well defined. Okay, and then what I do is that I take this value this function, and in the z-coordinate, I extend it harmonically into the domain. And that gives me a function of x. So this function is automatically harmonic in x. Okay? And because of the fact that the log of the modulus of a distance is harmonic everywhere away from the point where the modulus is zero, then also this is harmonic in y. So this is, in fact, harmonic in both, both coordinates. Okay? And in fact, that's another thing, is that it's also a symmetric function. You can uh, exchange x for y, and then you get the same thing. Okay, so let me uh, state a couple of these properties. So, so here are some facts. Okay, so this function uh, for x, y in... Okay, so, the, so the, there's a standing assumption that d tilde is a subset of d, okay? <coughs> So I only look at this function when uh, both arguments are inside the smaller domain. Has the following property: so is is uh, is non-negative, uh, is is positive semi-definite, uh, is harmonic and harmonic in both coordinates. And it's symmetric. Okay, so, so okay, and those are things that you need to check. So you know, you just check them. Okay. I'll, I'll I'll perhaps explain a little bit of this. Uh, you know, if I if I get to actually proving uh, using some of these properties. Okay, so a function of this form is a covariance of a Gaussian process, and therefore I can define a Gaussian process with this being the covariance. Uh, Okay, so hence there exists a Gaussian process, which I'll call phi d d tilde x indexed by d tilde. Okay, so these are this is a multivariate normal uh, process indexed by points in d tilde, such that you know to fix the distribution, the mean of this is zero, and the covariance of phi d at x and phi uh, d tilde at y is this function c d d tilde uh, x y. Okay, and then, then the fact that the covariance is in fact a harmonic function in both coordinates that implies that the sample paths of this process are harmonic in both coordinates, almost surely. Okay, so there's there's a there's a machinery that of, of Gaussian processes that you can uh, uh, that you can uh, apply this to. So let me, let me write it here. I'm kind of too short for this. Uh, moreover, so x goes to uh, phi d d tilde of x is harmonic. Uh, almost surely. Okay, so which means with probability one, the sample path of this is harmonic. <sighs> Should write the capital Y. Okay. So being a harmonic function, it's of course differentiable anytime you want. So it's you know it's a nice smooth field in the limit. Now, if you try to take the argument to the boundary, then of course uh, you know the the things get worse and worse, and that's because when you look at these integrals. Once the z approaches the boundary point, then you start to pick up these singularities. And the variance of this field, in fact, goes to infinity. 
And formally, the covariance, if you sort of take two points and make them go to different uh, boundary values, it will actually converge to the log of the modulus of the difference, okay? So it has the covariance structure on the boundary, at least in this limiting sense, is that of the continuum Gaussian free field, okay? So the way you should think of this is that you take the continuum Gaussian free field, whatever it means, restrict it to the boundary of the domain and extend it harmonically inside, okay? And you can formulate this more precisely by saying take the continuum Gaussian free field uh, defined on the space of nice functions by projecting it on the space of nice functions. And now you project it on functions which are harmonic in the domain. Okay? That's a, that, that's a closed up space in the Dirichlet, uh, in the Dirichlet in a product that you have. And, uh, and, and this will be exactly the realization of that. Okay, and why do I bother? Well, the point is that the binding field in the discrete setting uh, it converges in distribution to this, uh, to this continuum field. Okay, and this is, you know, a fact which I will, you know, I have the proof written actually over there, but I, but I will, uh, again, not, uh, uh, not uh, give you the details because it would just take forever, is that the law of the, right, if I have a dn and d tilde n uh, at a point dot over n, right, so this is now, you know, so I take this as a, a you know, I kind of just take this field, this field is indexed by a point in the lattice, okay? Uh, right, and this is not what I'm doing, right? I mean, multiplied by n. Okay, so I take this as a, f I think of it as a field in the continuum, but you know, then I, I now multiply the argument by n, okay? So the claim is that this distribution converges in, this random field converges in law to phi d d tilde. And the proof of this is actually not that hard because, you know, essentially to prove convergence of Gaussian processes, you just have to show that the, uh, that the uh, means and variances converge. And that's, you know, that's the basically the content of the proof. That gives you the convergence in the sense of finite dimensional distributions. And then you need some regularity statements to in fact push this into a stronger convergence if, you, if that is your desire, okay? So if you're happy with finite dimensional distributions, that will be done by that. And, uh, and for more st stronger things, you have to use some, uh, you know, somewhat fancy Gaussian uh, technology to, to prove that this, in fact, is in the supremum norm, for instance. Okay. <coughs> but again, you know, this is way, way beyond the level of explicitness I want to do. Okay, so here is the statement. So how does this uh, symmetry manifest itself at the level of the Z measure? Well, if D and D tilde are allowed domains with the property that the D tilde is a subset of D, but the Lebesgue measure of the difference is zero, uh, then the Z measure in D, dx, has the same law as E to the alpha phi D, D tilde of x as the measure in the tilde, dx, okay, were, were phi and uh, z, d, tilde are regarded independent. Okay, so this is sort of the representation, how to go from a domain to a subdomain. If you are only losing set of Lebesgue measure zero, then you have this nice partition, okay? So let's just look at sort of an example. So, you know, maybe my set is this, so this is my D, 
And my D tilde is that I just remove an arc like this. Okay. Well, then, of course, the Gaussian free field in this, in this D tilde domain will know that there is this arc in here. Okay. But how much will it know it? Well, it will know it because it's the values in D tilde, in the, in the D tilde n, uh, get modified by exactly the harmonic extension of the of the values in D from this arc into the into the domain. Okay, and at the level of the Z measure, it it, it manifests itself like that. Let me see if I. Um, okay, so I can actually give you some kind of an argument which uh, which will justify this. Okay, so, so, so that recall that H D N uh, is equal to H D tilde N uh, plus pi of D and D tilde N. Okay, like this, we have this equality in law. So if I look at, you know, so if I pick an, a nice function and I look at the, the, the extreme process associated with this uh, eta, so th with this uh, field, so n eta uh, n r of f. So this is this is the point measure. I can take on a function and I can integrate the point measure against the function. And what do I get? I get the sum over x is in d n. I get uh, f of x over n, and I get uh, h x d uh, minus m n. Okay. So this is the definition, and then there is the indicator. Uh, that the uh, that the point has to be uh, maximized in that. Okay. Now the paths, the sample paths of this field. I mean, we are on the discrete set. The, the sample paths are uh, are a harmonic, discrete harmonic, and therefore the field varies very little at lattice scale. Okay, because the derivative of this field in the continuum limit will be bounded. So if I look at the values at two neighboring points, it should be of order one over n. Okay. Which means that if I look at the local maximum of this point, it should coincide for n large enough with the lo local maximum of this point. Okay, so that means that I can essentially rewrite this as okay. And here's another lie. Uh, let me let me first comment on this lie uh, later. So I can write this as f x over n, and I can write this as h d tilde. Minus okay, but but the H D of course is not equal to that. There is the phi factor, right? So I get a phi of x uh, d uh, d tilde and uh, minus uh, m n. Okay, and then I have the indicator. Uh, but this indicator is for H, and this indicator is for the, uh, for the for the D set, and this is for the d tilde set. And there's another lie which I'm making here is that you know I reduce the sum from the set D n to this set. And that's because the total number of points in the difference of this set goes to zero. I mean, it's a, zero, it's a vanishing fraction of that. And it's a fact that, you know, you have to prove that uh, it's extremely unlikely that there will be, in fact, points that will contribute to these values in the difference of the two sets. Okay? So those are, those are, the, those are the little things you have to do. Okay? Okay, and so now you see that if I... So I can wrap this up again. I can wrap this up. Uh, using the now the process in the tilde, but now uh, the f will be different because the value of f will be changed by this phi factor in here. Okay, so instead of wrapping it up at the level of the uh, of the bracket, let me do this directly for the Laplace transform. So I claim that the expectation of the Laplace transform uh, of f. So my f I assume is positive, so that you know there are no, no problems. This is roughly the expectation of what, okay? So, so what I can do is that I can first condition on, the, on this process and then take the expectation of that, okay? So this uh, I will have, uh, I claim that I can write this as, and then I, then I wrap it up in, in terms of the other one. So this is eta uh, uh, r d tilde, and here I have a function which I write as f, f of phi, where, e to the minus f phi x h is written by taking the expectation of e to the minus uh, uh, minus f uh, uh, x h uh, plus, OK? 
okay? And I, and I do a, a bunch of, a bunch of, you know, I also replace this value by the, by the deemed limiting value of this thing, okay? Now let me write this like this. So, you know, so there's a lot of approximations that go into the statement, but it's, uh, it's going to be all right. All right. So I claim that this, you know, that this implies that. There's one aspect that you need to, uh, that you need to use, and that's the fact that, uh, that if I look at the points which contribute in here, because of my restriction on the local maximum, any, any two distinct points will be at least distance n from each other, okay? And at that level, you can essentially handle the correlation between the pi values. Okay, so this is, this is, this is the, uh, you know, this is what, what comes out of this calculation. You know, I'm not claiming that I have proved everything. I'm just sort of giving you the, uh, the overall idea. And now I plug this into the formula for the, now I plug this into the formula for the empirical measure, right? So the left-hand side of this converges. So in the limit, the left-hand side will converge to e to the minus, and here I get the integral, you know, and I get the intensity measure. And, you know, but the, the, the process goes to Poisson, and for Poisson processes, the Laplace transforms are, are computable using the following expression. Okay, so, so if you take a Poisson process and integrate this, you know, you get 1 minus e to the minus f integrated in the exponent against the intensity measure. That's a fact about Poisson processes. So that's the result of taking the limit of the left-hand side. And what do you get on the right-hand side? You get the same expression, but now you have the f, f phi in there, okay? And the f phi, I can, uh, actually, uh, I'm not doing it quite right. Uh, uh, sorry, this is, the expectation is not here. You know, I just, uh, I just have this definition, you know, I just replace this function. This is what, you know, I, I, I'm still taking the expectation with respect to phi. The expectation is not here. The expectation is now on the outside, so I get the x of uh, the, there is a minus, let me sort of write it using e, e to the minus the integral of a z dx, uh, e to the minus alpha h dh, and I have a 1 minus e to the minus uh, f phi of uh, x and h. Right, and now this expectation is with respect to z, which is now in d tilde, Okay, which comes from taking the limit of this theta process. And then there's another expectation, which is with respect to this field phi, which, you know, has been sitting on the outside of this whole game. And this is for the z measure. And now the trick is that I write this e to the minus f using this expression, and I see that this, this results essentially to just shift of the argument. So if I change variables inside this integral, this becomes e to the minus f, but this h gets shifted by exactly this amount. And that's exactly what produces the rather Nicodian term in front of the z d tilde. Okay, so that's uh, this is this is sort of the calculation that you get, and and you know all of the errors wash out in the limit, so this is in fact the total. Okay, so this explains the uh, this explains the Gibbs Markov property. And now why is this good? Well, because now you can start to you know do the game with you know taking smaller and smaller boxes, right? But it, this is still not, the, you know, the end of the story, unfortunately, because you know this, that would make life much, e much too easy. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, 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 what's the idea? The idea is that I take, you know, just think of taking, take a box, okay, and partition it to many boxes, you know, using sort of the regular subdivision, right? Okay, like this. And then what does this, you know, so, so the set of points that I remove by, you know, drawing these lines is a null set in the, in, in the sense of Lebesgue measure. And therefore, the measure in the whole box Okay, so let this be d, and my d tilde is the union of these uh, unit squares, right?
side is then, you know, I know is by law equal to the e to the phi of d, d tilde x of z d tilde. But now these sets, these squares, in fact, are disjoint from each other. So this z d tilde, in fact, partitions into independent, uh, independent measures. So this is a sum of independent measures. So I can write this as sort of a sum over i from 1. I guess I have 2 to the k of such boxes. And I will have e to the phi of d, uh, you know, d tilde i, which is just that box, uh, x. And I have the z of d i tilde dx. Okay, so this is how the, I should write the arguments in here. Okay, so now you see that if I now take this picture and I map it conformally somewhere, you know, maybe onto itself, then it becomes, the picture becomes distorted. Right, so let me sort of do it like this. Okay, it becomes distorted, but if my subdivision was very fine, that these are essentially, uh, these are essentially squares as well. Okay? So if I can now assert that the law of the z is rotational invariant, then uh, the whole effect on the measure would then be just how, how much bigger is that square compared to that square. And that's exactly the, the you know, that if you take the derivative at some point inside, that's, that's roughly the terrain, you know, very close to the, uh, the, the, the scaling factor is exactly the derivative of that. Okay? So that's sort of the idea, is that, you, that, that if I now conformally map this picture, uh, I, get, I, get, uh, you know, I get essentially the, 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 the measure in the new set. The measure in the new set is like the measure in, a, in an ordinary square, but multiplied by, uh, by uh, you know, the corresponding term in the derivative. Now you might ask, what happens with this term? Okay. Well, this is a you know this up this this field has the property that it's uh, that it's invariant under conformal maps. Okay, and that comes from the fact that the way it was defined, it was defined as you know as a projection onto this of the discrete of the continuum Gaussian free field, which is conformal invariant onto the class of harmonic functions, and harmonic functions transform into harmonic functions on the conformal maps. That's because, you know, Laplacian, it's, uh, it just pick up, picks up a scaling, so if the Laplacian is zero, then you, 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 you map harmonic functions into harmonic functions. So, so I need, need that the law of ZD is rotationally invariant, and I need that phi, uh, the law, Conformal invariant. Okay, so I claim that this is, you know, I've essentially given you the the, the reason why to, you know why this is true. Okay, and okay, and the proof of this is very hard. And the, you know, the way it's done is that you in fact have to go beyond this representation. You have to show that if you keep partitioning this limit, if if you keep doing this partition you can, in fact, replace these, essentially, by deterministic objects, okay? And so this is a, there, there's a, there's some kind of a, so for experts here, there's a derivative Martingale-like representation of the limiting measure, which, uh, which you know, where you replace this by the Lebesgue measure. So let me just give you the statement of that, and I think I'll, I'll end with that. And uh, whoever is interested in... Right, right. So, so, so the Gibbs Markov property gives you only relations between these. But if I can sort of drop this, then I will get ostensibly something which you know which is conformally invariant. And so that's sort of the uh, you know so that's the theorem. So let me give you that theorem. And I'll st I'll stop with that. Okay, I've I've written it up somewhere. Oh, here it is. Okay. So let me do this for let me do this for at uh, the. Uh, for simply connected domains, because I can already use the notion of conformal radius for her. So, uh, so define uh, psi d of x to be some constant c star uh, times the conformal radius uh, squared. Okay? Uh, then, for proper choice of c star, the 
following is true, is that if I look at the sum over i from 1 to 2 to the k, so these are, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm still thinking of this partition. Uh, I take, uh, so there's an overall multiplier, so I mean, I can write it before then. So there's an alpha, uh, there's a psi d of uh, x. Uh, and uh, now I do the sum, i from 1 to 2 to the k. And then I do, you know, and then there's, okay, I'll, uh, I'll, you know, there's an, there's an indicator of an event which makes this a regular. Okay, so what I'm doing is that I'm writing sort of an exp expression that experts will recognize to be the derivative martingale. So there is an alpha times the variance of this field minus the field, and in the and then this will be multiplied by exponent by e to the uh, alpha times the field d i x uh, minus alpha squared over two times the phi d d i uh, of x. Okay, so this is an expression for the derivative martingale. Maybe I could have fit it in there. So these, these are multiplying each other uh, times dx. Okay, so all of this is a readily fit in there with respect to the Lebesgue measure. And this converges in law as k goes to infinity. And then there are some other limits, which I'll tell you in a minute. This is dd of x. Okay. So essentially what it says is that you see that there is this exponential factor in here, and that gets reproduced in here. And then there's a bunch of other terms, which is the, uh, I, I owe you there's a variance in here. There's a variance of phi of uh, d i of x uh, times dx. Okay, so there's a, in the exponent, you have e to the phi of the field. That won't surprise you that you have in here. But then you replace the z dx by a bunch of terms. And one of them is, this is a deterministic term. So this is just the e to the variance. But you also have a term which still depends on the phi, where you write the alpha variance of that minus the value of the phi. Okay? And now there is an event ai, which, you know, which I will not describe, but that essentially says that all of this is not too bad. Okay? So for instance, you, know, you require that this, this, this quantity be positive okay, on the event and that the exponent of this be bounded. Okay, so there's a, there's a bunch of sort of things that you have to deal with. And those, those, those things will, convert, you know, will happen with probability tending to one. Okay? So if you do this mollification in here, then, uh, then this, this whole thing, this is now a, a measure defined on these boxes, but with respect to the back measure, converges weakly in law uh, to the ZD measure. Okay? Right, and you know, and once you've proved that, that proves the uh, that proves the rotation invariance for this, because the field phi was defined only in the continuum. So whether I do it for that box or that box, uh, the the transform it, it transforms conformally. Okay, and so therefore the measure transforms. Uh, I mean, the, it transforms uh, you know, under rigid rotation. And once I prove the rotation invariance, then this argument can be uh, bolstered to prove the conformal invariance. So, you know, so let me, let me just, you know, so, so the proof of this is actually pretty hard and constitutes, you know, half of the paper. Uh, at the end of the proof, we, we, in fact, have a way to, you know, this also gives you a way to characterize measures, which, uh, you know, measures with these properties by, by such limits. And so, so we, in fact, have a theorem which says that if the measure is, satisfies Gibbs Markov property, is conformally invariant, and has some uh, you know, uh, satisfy some tail, uh, tail estimate probability, then in fact this representation will realize the measure back. And in fact that essentially proves uniqueness of this, uh, of this object. Okay. And so, so this uniquely characterizes these measures. And now you can go and then there, are, then there are statements in the literature where this measure is supposed to be what's, what's called the derivative martingale associated with the, with the continuum Gaussian free field. And you can check whether these conditions are satisfied. The unfortunate thing is that for, that for the constructions that exist in the literature, we are only able to verify all but one of these conditions. 
and that's the one condition we don't know how to do. So the paper so far does not claim equality with that uh, with that object, but it's m it would be equal if you can verify the specific condition for that construction. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, okay, so you know, so the the the, the ex, you know the simple answer to this is I don't know. Okay, uh, you know the next simplest answer is that presumably if you take fields, you know, there's a class of gradient models with strictly convex interactions, you would expect the same thing to happen in that case. So once the interaction is isotropic, for instance. Okay, and but we at that level we know that there's some Gaussian approximation to the process at a large scale, but it only you know you you. The, techno the technique that's required for it requires some homogenization arguments, and you know I don't see how to implement those in the current setting. But it is certainly one of the uh, possible extensions of this work. Now, once you go beyond strict convexity, you know how it breaks loose. But, uh, I think that you know nobody knows. Really. So. so perhaps you know perhaps a more approachable question would be you know whatever happens on other lattices. And so on, okay? And that, you know, if and when we write our paper the way I want, our third paper the way I want it, uh, I think we should be able to prove that, for instance, the measure that you, that you get uh, for the Gaussian free field on the square lattice will be the same that you get on the triangle lattice. There's some kind of universality up to a constant multiple. And the universality comes from the fact is that, that all of these measures should satisfy the conditions I said of the uniqueness theorem. So if you can verify those conditions, then the measure is unique. If the phi's, if the phi's were piecewise constant on the boxes, uh, you would get exactly your derivative marking done. Because the phi is essentially the sum of the individual contributions as you go through the through the tree structure. Well, you know, it's related by what, what I just said. I mean, the problem here is that these are not, these are not constant, and in fact, you should not think of them as constant. Be uh -huh. You mean this? It's basically the same thing, yeah. It's, it's, yeah. It's a, it's a way to kind of iterate your, iterate your, uh, yeah. you know, your decomposition to, to the point is that you can, you know, then this is essentially small, and you can kind of replace it by whatever you want, you know, as long as it has the right dimensionality, it will, it will do the right thing. Okay, but the, but the actual proof of this connection is, is, is fairly non-trivial because. Because what happens is that the contribution to this measure will come from the places where this is, in fact, very large. If you assume that this is, you know, if you just take the, the sets of points, uh, boxes for which z is bounded by a million, then this will contribute zero asymptotically to the expression. So there is a conspiracy between the values, and the phi on, that, on those boxes also has to be large. So there is a conspiracy between those two effects. You need this large and, and this excessively large. Right, exactly. Right, so you, you you pick up sort of you pick up tail, yeah, yeah. kind of tail behavior, and right. 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 Well, the point is that in the tail behavior, you can think of this as a Lebesgue measure. Okay. That's the point. Right, but these factors, so you know, this is the magic. I mean, this is what I didn't show you. There is a magic that 
allows you to gr groom these factors in such a way that a unique term pops up. And, uh, and this is, you know, so that's the, uh, so, so, so in fact, the derivative martingale in the ordinary literature will be just this sum. And if you want to have the z measure, then you get this uh, conformal radius square term. And that's the term which makes the measure, the, the total mass of the measure molly in, go down as you go to the boundary, right? Because this is the conformal radius square. So if you're close to the boundary, the mass vanishes quadratically. That's the effect of the, that's the, that's the effect of zero boundary conditions, yes. So it took, it took us a while to in fact be able to, you know, you have to prove so this psi of d expresses the tail behavior of these, of these objects. You need to have an explicit formula for this pi psi in order to be able to wrap it up in this form. Otherwise, you would get some terms which sit here, which depend on the sort of microscopic uh, position of the box. I'll be here tomorrow, so I'm not last, yeah.